Right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Circular Living Symposium, Upcycling Our Planet 2019. And we are ready to lead you into the panel discussion, which is on upcycling our planet through collaboration. We'll find out how different sectors are working together to address this issue of upcycling and also the global movement to drive sustainability. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, I'd now like to invite our panelists to the stage. Please warmly welcome Ms. Irene Diaz-Ruiz, Project Manager of EcoAlf Spain. And next, a big round of applause, please, for Mr. Stuart Hawkins, Austin Public Affairs and Sustainability Director, Coca-Cola ASEAN Thailand. And and next, ladies and gentlemen, a big warm welcome for Kun Patipan, Sukhon Thaman, Chief Operating Officer, Downstream Petrochemical Business, PDT Global Chemical Public Company Limited from Thailand. And Pratan Chati, Fai Patibat Kan, Klum Trikit, Petroleum, Kan Plai, Naka, Jak GC, Kohai Kiet Ma, Rooms on Hanaka Prao, Nishuang Ni, Dui Naka. And next, ladies and gentlemen, please give it up for Mr. Christian Lara, CEO and founder of Recycle App Chile. ขอเสียงมือต้อนรับนะคะผู้ก่อตั้งและ And also welcoming back to the stage is Mr. Arthur Huang, CEO and founder of MiniWiz. A big round of applause, please. จาก MiniWiz นะคะเดี๋ยวคุณอาร์เธอร์ฮวงจะกลับขึ้นมานะคะ And Miss Lily Gosedagat from National Geographic Society. It's great to have you back. And the moderator for this session is Dr. Thomas Koch, senior partner of McKinsey and Company. How about a big welcome for our moderator? And now I'd like to hand over the stage to our moderator. So, welcome everybody to the panel session. I can imagine a lot of people are still outside or still queuing to the restrooms. That took quite a, <laughs> quite a while, so maybe Arthur is also in one of the, in, in one of the queues. Um, let me take the moment also to say thank you. Um, thank you to GC to make this happen. Yeah. Bringing all us together and talk about this, at this topic, at this time, is fabulous, so thank you to GC. But I would like to thank all the 1,500 people in the room. And, and it's, if you look at the room, this room is packed. And everybody takes a day out of their schedule. We all have a day job, I understand. But to spend the day thinking about the issue, I think this is, this is really good. So thank you for that. So we heard earlier also some of the presentations, some inspirational stories from Arthur, from Lily, from, from Ellen MacArthur Foundations. So thank you for doing that. We will hear four more stories and they will be very different because everybody has a different background. We have people from, from Chile and I think what makes this panel very good is it is a very broad panel very diverse. Look, if you step back, we have everybody in the value chain. We have the producers with Kunpatipan from GC. We have three entrepreneurs. We heard about them. Christian from Chile, Irene, Arthur. We have the big brand names from Coca-Cola. Stuart, thank you very much for making it. And we have the storyteller, who is our conscious. Uh, to make things. And I think this makes this panel special and we want to hear the stories of the other four. So without further ado, Irene, if we can ask you to make our, your first story. The rules are very hard here, I must say. You have only eight minutes and you will be prompted. Very good, Irene. Eight minutes. Uh, clicker. Yeah. Where is the clicker? I think it's a very good question. No, that's, that's the clicker. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, good morning. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, GC2, for inviting us, and thank you for trusting us to make upcycling the option Thailand 
uh, possible. Thank you to the government, Tourist Authority, to, to, to join us in this amazing adventure that we began two years ago. But here I am to talk about Equalve. It's a very small company. It's a fashion company, in fact. And we want to say that we are a sustainable company. It's, it's a good challenge for us to be able to say that we began being a sustainable company. We didn't change our mind. We was born sustainable, or that's what we trained. So when we began, we said that, okay, how can we be more sustainable? Because fashion industry, in fact, is one of the most polluting in the world. And it's something that we all are guilty for because we are all dressed and we are all consumers of fashion. And it's something that many of us don't realize how impactful is fashion in all, his, all its faces, not only from the raw materials, also for the transportation, for the people that make our clothes, but also what happened then. For example, in Spain it said that about 20% of our landfills are full of text textile waste. And it's due to our model consumption, it's due to a low-cost model, and it's due to many other uh, issues that we have to face. So from our point of view, we decided that to make it more sustainable, this amazing industry and global industry, we, we wanted to do something new. It was to take trust and make it into a treasure for us. No, there are outside, there are hundreds of, of, of tons of, of trust that we can create into new garments, new products with a very high value through an upcycling process. No, as we have the name of this amazing symposium is upcycling our planet. I'd say we say upcycling, upcycling our trust to make something more valuable. So what we do mainly is we want to make action. We want to be storytellers, but we want to be also story doings. And we want to do our beat. And our beat is begin to move. Yeah, move forward and step by step. We have many things to improve. Fashion have many drawbacks, but we want to, we want to improve. So we want to stop using natural resources in a careless way. And we think that recycling is a good way to do it. We want to make things that are sexy, as it was said before, uh, are cool and are fashionable. We are not a recycling company, we are a fashion company and we want to make fashion. So we recycle different things. We recycle PET, we recycle nylon, use tires, uh, post-consume uh, coffee and also natural fibers. But it's not only about what we do, it's about how we do it. Because we can do amazing recycled products, but if we are not worried about its carbon footprint, or we are not worried about the chemicals that are used, it makes no sense. So we have to take into account a circular, a circular economy for the fashion. And in that case, what are we doing? We're trying to make it more durable. I think a very important thing for the, for the circular economy is the lifespan of our garments. Uh, it's, it's very important, the, the recycling phase, it's very important, uh, the reduced phase, but it's also how durable is it? How can it make the, a, big, a great quality, something that can be repaired many times, reused many times? No? That's, that's an example of our uh, flips that are also in the exhibition you can, you can touch, they are very hard, and they are made all in a local uh, economy in Spain, uh, based on user tires. No? And what also we can do, we can avoid chemicals to make it more natural. For example, coffee is one of the ways that we use to make, to give the garment some properties and avoiding the use of chemicals. What else? We can, we have to think about the whole eco design, no? We have to think about the whole life of our products from the beginning. In this case, we have these sneakers made from marine litter, uh, thanks to the Upcycling the Oceans project. But it's not only about the material, the polyester recycled for marine litter, it's about the soil, it's about, it's, it's knitted in only one piece to avoid leftovers. So we have to think uh, the whole product and obviously without forgetting that we are a fashion industry, okay? So it has to be sexy or cool or fashionable too. Um, and that's, that's a slight I love, but because we are a very small company, we are 30, 
35 people in Madrid. We was born in 2012. Uh, so without our partnerships, we are not nothing, no? We need our partners, we need our supply chain to work hand in hand to make it possible. Because there are many drawbacks, as I said before, for the fashion industry. There are many things to be done, and it's a super global, huge industry with many faces. So we have to work in a collaborative innovation for circularity to, to solve that gaps and to make things, to make things better. That's just an, as an example, sorry, because the texts are in Spanish, but, but um, that's an example that we did in Black Friday. No, you know that's big event in November where everybody got crazy about buying and buying and buying more. No, uh, so we decided that not Black, Black Friday for a golf. No, we wanted to recycle Black Friday, so we uh, launched a campaign with. Uh, information about the facts of the global industry and instead of doing sales for our clients we say okay you have a garment from Equalf okay is it damaged yes okay we can repair it for free that's something quite easy and really cheap in fact with a huge impact because our client decided to repair their garments for second hand or for reuse it or for a present uh, instead of buying something new, instead of um, getting a discount. And it worked. In, in fact, we <laughs> increased the sales that day. But it was not only about that, it was about raising awareness, about uh, touching people and saying what's happening with the fashion industry, what can be done, and what can we do as citizens, no? Because it's, I would say in our claim, there is no planet B, because there is no planet B, neither there is an ocean B. So we, if we really want to, to make the difference, even with doing our bit, we have to begin to change our mind and think ourselves how, all, how, how are all we dress, what was it made, is it necessary, who did it? That's kind of question that would really make the difference because there is no planet B. Thank you. Thank you very much, Arin, for your story. Really appreciate it. So if we move from a small attacker, if you may say, so to a larger company with brand steward, how do you deal with circular economy and these type of things? Sure, thanks. And thank you, Thomas. Thank you, PTT, for the, the kind invitation to be here. Let me just see if I can get these slides up. Great. I think like so many of the, the people here, on the panel, so many of the people, the organizations in this room, we are really determined to step up on this, this crucial topic. And it was really with that in mind that um, in January last year, we launched something called World Without Waste, which is a really big goal. It's a goal that by 2030, we're going to help collect and recycle one bottle and one can for everyone that we put into the marketplace and so it's a massive undertaking. It's extremely ambitious and it's a really big priority for us. We're really committed to, to pursuing this with our partners. And so what I thought I'd do just to bring some life to this is share with you a video that talks to the vision. This was put together by our Philippines team. Philippines is our largest market here in Southeast Asia. Um, and that will talk a little bit about the vision, what we're trying to do, and how it fits in with everything we've been talking about this morning in terms of a circular economy. Coca-Cola imagines a world where waste is not wasted and instead makes its way to a place where trash can transform from something forgotten after use to something of value and with limitless use. From something that is thrown away to something that creates communities that thrive. From a reimagined resource to something that has a life beyond its initial use. Transforming ways of living that generates jobs, inspires dignity, and creates partnerships by creating something that can be used over and over and over 
and over again. Refreshing the planet and paving the way for a better future. This is the vision of Coca-Cola. To collect and recycle every bottle or can we sell by 2030. But we can't do it alone. Together as one country, one community, we can turn the vision of a world without waste into reality. Let's go beyond good and refresh the way we see our waste for a better tomorrow. Be part of our journey. So, as you can see from the video, collaboration towards a circular economy is, is really at the heart of what we're trying to do. And maybe I can spend a, a few minutes just talking through the, the, the circle and the chart here on the, the left. I'm really glad that many of the previous speakers talked about design because it starts at the top of this chart with the way that we design and make the packaging. So there, there are a couple of really big commitments under World Without Waste. The first is that um, we're committing to make all of our packaging portfolio 100% recyclable by 2025. That's our commitment to the Alan MacArthur Foundation. Actually, in countries like Thailand, we're already 100% there, so we're, we're well on the way. Um, but the second big commitment is around using more and more recycled content in our, in our products. And many of the speakers have referred to this as well. It's something that we've already started to do in Europe, in parts of Asia, in Latin America. It's something we haven't really started much in this part of the world, here in Southeast Asia. Uh, but it can be done, and it's a really exciting approach when we think about the circular economy. Just on Wednesday, this picture on the middle panel here, that's a picture, an announcement that came out of Australia from our team there. And we have managed to crack the code in Australia on a carbonated soft drink packaging that is 100% recyclable. And the, the commitment in Australia is that all of our carbonated soft drinks and our, our water, which is already in 100% recycled plastic, all of our packaging will be in 100% um, recycled plastic um, for our single serve beverages in Australia. So it's really exciting. It's probably the first in the Coca-Cola system globally where we've been able to, to, to move forward that quickly on the technical innovation side. Um, but here in, in Southeast Asia, we're also pursuing this um, very aggressively. Two weeks ago, actually, in Manila, we just launched uh, the, the first fully 100% recycled PET beverage bottle in the Philippines uh, with our Vivo water brand. So we're going to be doing this more and more to be able to, to meet our goals by, by 2030. To enable all of this to happen, there's obviously got to be a massive focus on, on collection and collection for recycling. And there again, we're not really starting from, from scratch in this part of the world. Collection for recycling rates here in, in ASEAN are actually relatively high, driven by a very active, informal sector um, who make their livelihoods from collecting, recycling, selling these, these materials that have value. So how are we going to drive these rates up higher? Well, I guess the answer is we're not going to be doing this alone. We've learned from great case studies in South Africa, in Mexico, where the industries come together with voluntary, industry-led kind of um, packaging recovery organizations that drive up these rates year in, year out by doing really sustainable programs that empower the informal sector. And so we're gonna be copying that approach um, and rolling that out across Southeast Asia. In Vietnam, in Ho Chi Minh City, just last Friday, we were really honored to join with eight other companies in the consumer goods space to launch Vietnam's very first PRO. So that's a really big milestone and something, again, we're gonna be pursuing further. And then the, the final piece of the puzzle is, I guess, the top left-hand part of this diagram. And that's how we close the loop and turn and make old bottles into new bottles again. And that obviously takes infrastructure, it takes investment, it takes collaboration and partnership. Again, we've been doing this with food-grade recycling plants in many places around the world. Um, and it's something that we're going to be pursuing very actively here in ASEAN. Again, just this month, we announced our commitment to invest behind the very first um, PET food-grade recycling facility in the Philippines that's going to be online uh, in 2020. So that's indicative of, of how we're trying to drive the, the, the circular economy. 
So if I was to sum up the strategy and sum up where we're trying to take this over the next decade, it's really around three areas. One is design and design for recyclability, design for circularity. The second area is collect, make sure we bring the bottles back to be used again and again and again, drive up those collection for recycling rates. And how we're gonna do this is through partnership at the global level, at the regional level, at the local level, and at the very, very grassroots level. And so we're very optimistic this can be done. I mean, I think everyone in this room recognizes that there is a problem, but the good news, it's, it's a solvable problem. And with symposiums like this, and with all of the um, engagement we've had over the last year and a half into this journey, we've seen a lot of positive energy. Um, and so we're excited and very committed to the journey ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stuart. That was very clear. I like the simplicity of the strategy, yeah, very clear. If we move now upstream, if I may say, so not to the bottles, to the producer of the raw materials of the bottles, if you look at this, what, what, what do you think? How is GC dealing with this? It's overwhelming. But we, we think this one is our opportunities. Because we cannot avoid social environmental requirements. We need to follow what the world requires and we need to preserve our beautiful worlds. At PTGC is actually, we're aiming to reduce the single-use plastic grids, which we are producing 150,000 tons per year, to be zero in the next five years. By turning the single-use plastic grids to become a more durable one. As world, world trends go up and require more durable, more good qualities, plastic products, just imagine automotive, right? The EV trend is coming. Weight reductions will be the key. You may imagine in the past, maybe 20, 30 years ago, a compact-sized car weighs around 900 kilos. At this time, the compact-sized car weighs about 1,300. This is because of safety requirements and a lot of luxury requirements. By adding, changing into a batteries, the weights of car will be increasing, and therefore they need some new material for balancing it. Right? You may see in the future, a lot of important parts of car producing from plastic, which are maybe a suspension beams, which someone is producing at this moment. Construction material require a more durable, stronger, lighter. That's why PTGC is changing from 150,000 tons single-use grade plastics to be the more durable, which are those kind of pipes, constructions, growing ups. Wire and cable, fiber, or large blow, right? But at the same time, when we're changing from 150,000 tons to the durable one, how our customer will do? Because they will not have the plastics to convert into the films any longer. That's why PTTC, which we are considered ourselves a technology company, that's why we are investing long times ago and sometimes in the past we are suffering bioplastics. We have both PLA, polylactic acids, and PBS, polybutylene succinates, where PLA is now is producing there in the United States, and PBS is producing here in Thailand. We are trying to persuade our converter, the film converter, to help us testing the films producing from bioplastic, which is a compostable one, right? And they will have the business all together in the future because actually we cannot ban the whole 100 plastic bags. Some application plastic bags still need to be used and we offer the choice to them. Utilizing plastic bags with biocompostabilities. For the recycle, Actually, we are now studies a recycle plants capacity of around 
35,000 tons RPET and 15,000 tons RPEs. And we are producing food grade as well. So if Coca-Cola interests in the future, it's okay. The key success of these recycled plants is not building the plants. It's not selling the products. Because the product at this moment, people require a recycle. But the collections, I like the words that Kun Ying Tong Thip said in the morning, that returns. Everybody in these rooms, when we consume, when we consume and we're going to waste the products, think about returns. Returns to the right way. Return the best at its best quality. Some people in some country, they even clean the waste before they dump into the bins. If that is the case, we have a better qualities of bail. And once you have better qualities of bail, the yield of recycle is getting better. Right? This is what PTGC is going to do. But that's one is recycle the plastics to become the same applications. But we also seeing another interesting, which that's why we are joining hand with Eagle Our Foundations, helping the upcycling the ocean project, Thailand's together. Because we say, actually, we don't have, don't have to recycle to become the same products. We can recycle products to having higher values. The upcycling comes from up values the recycled products. That's why it comes up to upcyclings. And it needs to join hand with a lot of people in the supply chains, designer, producer, and everybody in the supply chains. And we're doing that because we need to create awareness to everybody. We need to create awareness to the user, right? It's good that once we talk about this kind of collaboration with our supply chain partners, everybody is willing to do with us, right? Come back to the bioplastics. At this moment, people complaining about bioplastics that is very expensive. For the PLA, sometimes it's more expensive than normal polyethylenes, made two times. For PBS, even more expensive than that. Because at this moment, we still, we are in the early stage of bioplastic productions. But just consider this, Thailand, we are agriculture countries. We have a lot of sugar. Bioplastic, mo mostly made from sugar base, right? We can build up bio complex and bio refineries here, bring everything, integrations from farming, biochemicals, bioplastic, and in connecting with those kind of converter and producers. And that's, we believe that we can bring the cost of bioplastic down. Joining hand with converters from the beginning, if they're trying to run the bioplastics, of course they need to modify and fine tune the machineries. But again, if they do more and more of productions, in the stable volumes, the loss will be less and less. The efficiency of production will be more and more. So this is what PTGC is aiming for in the future. Thank you, Kam. Thank you very much, Kampariban. Let's move to the end of the whole value chain, if I may. So we know how it's produced, how it's made, and Christian, why don't you not share your story? What is the trick to collect? Yeah, thank you so much for the invitation. Well, I'm Chris. I'm from Chile. I'm 26 years old. I'm, I'm the founder of Resic Lab. Uh, you know that uh, we create this uh, mobile app because uh, if this is working, yeah. We are facing one of the biggest problems right now with the garbage. Yeah, you can see in social media, you share a lot of time the videos in, on Facebook, on Instagram. But the truth the true is, in my country, in Chile, the last year, we produced 17 million of tons of garbage in 12 months. And you know how much we recycle of that? 1% in Chile. 
only 1% of the garbage that we produce in a single year was recycled. So a good question is, why the people are not recycling right now? And the numbers are clear. 40% of the people don't know where or how to recycle. Some people don't want to recycle, and others don't have time for doing this process. So who is recycling in Chile, in Thailand, in all the world right now? They, the waste figures. They are more than 10 million people that are working in the street around the world right now, but working in poor condition because the waste picker is not an official job. They are looking the gains of the day into a trash can. That is why we create Reciclab, a mobile app that connects people who have reusable material in their house, uh, in their apartment, in their office, in their building, and we connect directly with waste picker. And how does it work? It's very simple. First, you need to declare how much material you have in your home, then we, create, then we create optimized route and we give to the waste picker. They pass by your place, pick up all the material, and sell to companies of recycling. So this is the easy way to recycle. It's free for you, and you can win points with each request you send, and you can find amazing awards in the app. Awards like sustainable awards and just beer. We give beer to the people. That an award for recycling. Interesting model, right? Yeah, but how we made it? How how we how we make money? How we survive? And we got a business model. We work with a group of big companies like Unilever, Carlsberg, and they pay for our data of collection that we are raising with the waste picker. It's a complex model, and I can give more details in the coffee break if anyone who want to talk. And, but basically, they, they work with us for two big reasons. One of them is our traction. We, got, we had a incredible numbers like in social media, count of followers, and we got more than 20,000 users in the app in Chile. And for our social impact, for one of our clients, HP, we create the biggest campaign of recycling that we are making in Chile. We took all the printers that the people have in their house in 12 cities. You know, Chile is one of the largest countries in the world, so the, the logistic is a headache. But we made it with just waste picker. We collect all of the printers, we recycle, and then we transform all the printers in orthopedic arms. Cute, right? And you want to know how we made it? Yeah, you can see in the next video. Sin duda que hoy en día la tecnología es fundamental para nuestro desarrollo. Also, pero eso trae consigo Spanish. el problema de los residuos provenientes de esta industria. Afortunadamente, corporaciones como HP y sus clientes han hecho posible que cantidades de desechos no sean enviados a rellenos sanitarios, creando campañas de reciclaje con un tremendo aporte de valor a nuestro medio ambiente y a nuestra sociedad. HP en esta búsqueda de darle un destino sustentable a los distintos productos que tienen las personas en su hogar y que potencialmente se pueden convertir en un desecho peligroso, contactó a Reciclab para co-crear esta campaña que buscó finalmente transformar cientos de impresoras que fueron recolectadas y se le dio un destino sustentable. Todas las impresoras recolectadas llegan a la planta de reciclaje electrónico en Valdivia. Y ahí es donde se separan la mayoría de los componentes peligrosos para darle un destino aún más sustentable a estos productos. Hola Cristian, ¿cómo estás? Aquí tenemos todas las impresoras que se han recolectado en esta campaña. Cuéntame tú, en esta planta, qué es lo que vamos a hacer o qué es lo que hacen ustedes con estas impresoras. Llegó la impresora acá, se desarma, se desmembra completa. Dentro de lo que se recupera, el 70% es plástico, ABS. Ese plástico se retira, se le saca todo lo que es el metal. De ahí pasa una máquina chipeadora que lo pique y lo transforma en pellet. Y este pellet se va a Santiago, donde lo ocupan como materia prima para las impresoras 3D. O sea, de una impresora que se recicló, tenemos una gran cantidad de material y de ese porcentaje de material, mucho material va a ser plástico que sirve para ayudar. 
En Cactus nosotros fabricamos filamentos para impresoras 3D a partir de residuos plásticos. Este es muy importante que una gran empresa como HP se involucre y confíe en nosotros y que nos motive durante todo el proyecto. Nosotros tomamos los residuos plásticos que ya fueron preprocesados y los sometemos a nuestra línea de extrusión para transformar este pellet de plástico reciclado en filamento para la impresora de la tierra. HP ha orquestado toda esta colaboración para ayudar a nuestro planeta, pero también para incentivar soluciones que cambien la vida de los que habitan en él. Aquí se hace todo el diseño, los elementos, las partes imprimir y después se traspasa a la impresora. La impresión 3D es esta maquinita, funciona con, con plástico, con un, como un carrete de hilo de plástico y se va derritiendo y va construyendo las prótesis. Llevar a esto una prótesis es como darle un uso útil a los distintos materiales que se están botando actualmente. Todo esto lo acompañamos con un proceso de rehabilitación y seguimiento para cada uno de nuestros beneficiarios. Que viene a ser una parte muy importante para que podamos sacarle el gran provecho a la prótesis y también ellos se puedan como involucrar dentro de las actividades de la vida diaria normal. Y ya cuando se le entrega y ven la funcionalidad, es un mundo nuevo. Desde la conciencia de cuidar el medio en el que vivimos hasta ayudar a estos niños que realmente lo necesitan, esta campaña ha ido creciendo y sumando apoyo. Solo podemos dar las gracias a iniciativas como estas y a todos los que participan en ella. Eh. If you didn't understand that, it's okay. Between Chilean, we didn't understand each other. Chilean and Spanish, one of the most difficult <laughs> languages in the world. But you can understand the context. We transform printers in orthopedic arm for these kids in, in Chile. So the question is, where are you waiting? Where are you waiting to start to recycling? And you could, you could join us. Join us to the Waste Speaker and shape the world and fight against the climate change. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. It was a very inspirational story from Chile, really. Thank you. Um, we heard four of additional inspiration stories to the other two. We'd like to open a bit now the Q&A. So we have about 20 minutes for Q&A. I will ask some questions around inspiration, challenges, and business opportunities. But I would like to keep also the floor open for some of, of the questions later. And I wanted to start with Arthur. We heard so many things about your business opportunity. You're long into it. And you, you really mesmerized the, the room here with your ideas and what's possible. My question is very simple. What inspired it to you? What was your lily moment in this coffee, in this orange chair, to make all this happen? And where does all the idea come from? Um, fortunately and unfortunately, it came from a personal anger at looking at how we consume, OK? Um, I always hate fashion people, even though I'm in fashion industry, sorry. Uh, but I mean, that's because I think this is full of shit, very fake. Um, uh, but in order to change that world, we need to be part of that world, okay? Uh, unfortunately, and this is kind of, and I think all this starts, starts in when I was in Rome. Uh, when I was studying in uh, 1999, uh, and I was in the archeology span class, and then when you, when all these tourists taking photos of these beautiful buildings, pantheons, that they little know that all these buildings are made from trash already. <laughs> and when we are doing archeological uh, digs uh, through all the different periods, it's actually, you're behind the brick wall and the stone wall, it's all trash. Trash from everywhere, from Egypt, from Greece, from, and it's all packaging waste. By the way, back then, ship it in Fora, it has dead animals, right? Uh, all the way to the human bodies, and all the way to um, any type of packaging waste, okay? So that is actually the building block of an ancient, I wasn't ancient, it's still the inspiration of the, what we call the modern, or, or the, this Western civilization, okay? It is still, okay? Uh, and so once you understand that, you're like, okay, 
we have really forgotten all the ancient wisdom that we have been uh, so accustomed to for the last millennium, right? So can we do that today? That's all. So anger plus a little <laughs> bit of history. Okay, that's a short answer. So, so we have the T version, we have the anger version. Yeah. So Lily, coming back to you, we heard your personal stories, but you touched so many people during your, your, your studies and so on. How do you see that other peoples are changing? So how do I see... How other people or companies are changing? What is their Lily moment? People are changing when they're inspired by other people. So, I mean, I'm sure a lot of us just watching that video and listening to everybody else speak on the panel today are going to be leaving feeling as though they have more confidence in moving forward with what circular economy is and what they can do about it. Whether you're a student or whether you are in a position of power in a business or whether you work in the government, you know, you listen to these stories and you have the opportunity to make a change depending upon where you are in your life and what resources you have. And I think, speaking from the United States' perspective, there's a severe disconnect in my country between what we consume and the environmental impact that we have. Because we're so separate from everything. We're separate from our food, we're separate from our waste, we're separate from our water. Everything is just consuming. So I think what these stories and opportunities can do is allow people to realize that they are connected in a system, that they are connected to the earth. I mean, when you go to Bangladesh and India and you see people living along the rivers, they know that their life is entirely dependent upon that water stream. And they know that with climate change and severe flooding and bar barrages disrupting the flow of water and the lack of fish that are coming in, that in an instant, everything will be taken away from them. And that climate change is a result of our production and our use, perhaps more so in the Western world, is affecting those people, millions, millions of people, you know, thousands of miles away. So we're all connected. And what the stories can allow us to do is to connect our lives to one another, connect to the earth, and then realize that we have the power and potential with innovation, with education, with IT, with ourselves, to do something about it. Very good, thank you. Irene, how did it start in Madrid? Well, uh, we, we start, um, well, in fact, our uh, manager and our CEO began the company after coming from the fast fashion industry. So he's, uh, he had a, a son called Alfredo, that was the company's name after him, EcoAlf, and he was really worried about the new generation, about the planet we are living to new generation. Now we are also worried about the generation we are leaving to our planet, because it's something that we don't tend to talk about, no? We say like, poor new generation, what disaster of planet we will leave. But if we talk about our behavior and their future behavior, we have to be really worried about how they will be as citizens in the future, and something that EcoAlf is working on, no? In raising awareness and to make better people for a better world. Thank you. Stuart, if I, how would you describe the Lily moment at Coke? We all would be very interested in yeah. that moment. So I can answer that on a personal level. I can also answer it on a Coke level. And they Please. actually coalesce. So on a personal level, I remember it very vividly because it was in March 2017 in Bali, Indonesia, where I was attending the World Ocean Summit uh, hosted by The Economist. There were a lot of people there over that two days. There was government, there was civil society, there was private sector, there were celebrities, Nat Geo was there. Uh, there were students, academics. I mean, it was a room packed full, kind of like this, packed full of, of very diverse cross-sector uh, representatives. And that was the first time personally that I really started to understand the depth and breadth and the scale of, of, of this issue and how we all need a sense of urgency. We all actually need to do something and step up. And why I say it coalesces with, you know, our corporate view on this is because that summer, about 30 to 40 people globally were tasked with really just thinking boldly about what actually we would do. So I was part of that team 
We have people from all over the world. We have corporate people. We have people from many different countries. We have Butler colleagues. And the intent was how are we going to do something really bold and transformational and ambitious in a way that maybe we'll fail, but at least let's, let's put out something aspirational and then try and hit that goal. And so that's how World Without Waste was born. There was a ton of senior leadership um, involvement in the whole process, led by the CEO, who then in January 2018 got up uh, shortly before the Davos World Economic Forum and made this commitment to the world. So I think my kind of lily moment also coalesced with a sense of the company that we really got to take this seriously, step up, and there's actually a solution that can be pursued here, um, as daunting as it, as, as it kind of seems in year 2018, 2017. Thank you, Stuart. Kun Patipan, was there a lily moment in GC, and what are the concerns as a producer you see? Because actually, PTGCs, we are interested in this kind of circular economy for quite some time. So that's why you may know that we invest in bioplastics maybe eight years ago, since its beginnings, and no one using the PLA product at that moment. But because PTGC is, and PTT groups, we're focusing on sustainability concepts. We have to take care of balancing between 2E and 1S, you know that, economies, environmentals, and social responsibility. That's why we are bringing everything all together. And now, we're expanding our concept through all of a customer and converter. But actually, one challenging is that the circular economies now is not yet standardized. It's different in countries by countries. For example, actually, we have variety of products. petroleum based petrochemical plastics, some of them non-composable, some of them Composable. Same as bio based plastics. Some of them non composable and some of them composable. But we cannot separate. We mix up somehow. I'm afraid somehow in the future, if we don't separate in, on applications, it's going to be very difficult to segregate. For example, drinking water bottle. Normally we're producing by PET, which is non-composable, need to be a recycled one. Some of them building by, producing by polylactic acids, which is compostables. But if we come up with the same physical appearance, how are we going to segregate it into the waste collections? And when it's mixed, the compostability is not work 100%. And when it's mixed, the recycle, when it's mixed between PET and PLA, is very difficult to recycle. So commitments, standardizations, and way of practice need to be discussed. Thank you. Christian, you showed us a very interesting app, the Uber app, yeah. more or less. Huh? Uber of recycling. Exactly. So, your time, call us like that. Yeah. And uh, I think everybody, when he looked at the app, said, wow, this, I saw Kunpatipan's eyes, oh, I can see that also in Thailand. So what other ideas do you have like this? Do you plan a global rollout or do you plan the new app? So where, where is your company going? Um, I think one of the most innovation ideas i ever seen is one of my partners in the campaign of, um, H with HP is Cactus. They, they, that is their name, and they transform all the plastic that you cannot recycle easily, like PP, HDPA, ABS, and they introduce in a new process, and they transform in filament for 3D printer, and then you can create anything, anything you want. So basically they are doing, taking all the plastic you cannot recycle and create all you can imagine. So glasses, keychain, um, sunglasses to orthopedic arm. So I think that is one of the most innovative and ideas I've ever seen. Is if for us, it's, it's an honor to work with them. Yeah. Thank you. 
would like to change a bit the gear towards the business angle. And Arthur, I would, I would like to, to start with you. What is for you the biggest bottleneck? Is it ideas? Is it money? Is it partnerships? Or where, where, where do you want to go going forward? Um, there's lots of good ideas out there in the world. As it's demonstrated, uh, I think, everywhere, any countries. So it's not the idea, it's the problem. It's not a bottleneck. Uh, it's totally about one thing, scale and inertia. Okay. First of all, there's a mismatch of scale, big time. We're generating too much waste, and then there's not enough scale of uh, demand for these material. Really, not enough demand. So that's why I see potentially fast fashion is actually a great, or fashion could be a way because people do buy these useless stuff. So you know, just get them to use it again. <laughs> you know, okay. So this is a scale gap. That's why we're in architecture in buildings is because of a scale gap because one wall of construction material, you easily take up tons of material. But for you to collect recycled material, for the recycler to be profitable, you need to have a certain volume to be able to pay them, right? So you need to bridge that scale gap and also with a financial gap in between. That's the first thing. Then, the, of course, the, I don't think technology, again, uh, I think demonstrate all here is not the issue, right? Um, so, of course, we definitely wish uh, Coca-Cola have that scale, uh, but they're still not doing it, really, until 2030, right? Yeah. Okay, so there is still a, I mean, we work with Coca-Cola. We work in your uh, headquarter. Um, do you remember TerraCycle? Do you know, I was, uh, we were in that program from the very beginning. I'm sorry to put you on the spot, but, you know, and, and that program went bust. Every time there's a good program, they have a proclamation to 2020, uh, you know, and then, then again, program disappear, you know? So, it's so this is, again, I just want to demonstrate, use that as an example for human inertia. It has nothing to do with um, the technology or, or with the great idea coming from the executive, but, you know, like, when you're going through a big organization like Coca-Cola, there's so many human inertia uh, in that whole supply chain. You have, it's not just like, you know, I cannot preach to everybody, like, you know, anyone who work with me or eat lunch or whatever with me, I think, I mean, you will get, get convinced to try to work with us, you know? That's what we do, what I do. But imagine you have to do that in every layer, that inertia of not changing, it accumulates, it multiplies. Uh, and so that's the... That's the bottleneck you say, inertia. So we need millions of lily moments to overcome the inertia. But I think the inertia, the most easiest um, to, to do that is when it hurts the profit margins, when it hurts the money part, when the government is clamped down on certain things uh, uh, because that hurts the profit margin, right? So it's survival. So once the survival, survivability of what we do become necessity, environment is too far away. You know, when you don't have enough money to bring home, that is very immediate. So when it hurts the immediacies, that's when the urgency comes and the inertia will disappear. <laughs> very good summary. Thank you. So, Irene, if I pick this topic of business, first of all, profits and so on, are you making profits? And what are for you the biggest challenges? Well, in fact, for us, the scale up is, is, a, is a point, no? Because... Um, at the end of the day, you have to explain our, your clients that you have, people say, oh, your garments are expensive. And we say, no, our garments have a fair price. It's not the same. They are, they are not expensive for the environment, okay? So if you have into account the whole process, obviously the recycling process currently is still uh, more expensive than the virgin materials. So we have to scale up this to make it more profitable. But also we need, uh, I think we need inform people. We need to be more transparent. Sometimes from companies we, we feel terrifying about sharing information, about, be, about our traceability. But we have to take that as an opportunity. Like if we have uh, demanding clients, we will be better, we will be more competitive, we will be faster. And we have to take that as a challenge, in fact, to make it 
these profits uh, to arrive because we are all companies and obviously we have to be also economically sustainable. But in a, to, not only to be the more profitable companies in the world, we want to be the best companies for the world too. That's, I think that's the key, the information to, for the clients. Very good. I get technical signs to close it, but I, can, I have one question to our Coca-Cola friend. Um, there is always the question of, does the customer pay for being conscious and we have recycled things? Do you see premiums in this game? I think we would want the consumer everywhere to have this mindset of choosing products and packaging with more and more recycled content. I don't think the consumer should have to pay like a premium, like it's some kind of niche product. I think the, the, the vision is how can we make this the new norm in beverage packaging where it's just like every product and every package is made with recycled material and it just becomes an illustration that it's not some kind of abstract concept but a reality that they're not going to have to uh, think of as some kind of niche thing. So that, that's our vision and I think we're going to get there. Very good. I think that's a very good closing comment. Uh, Unfortunately, we are running out of time. I know I had also prepared m many more questions, but uh, we have to finish. would like to finish with saying a big thank you to our Hot Seats candidates here. Thank you very much. <laughs> and maybe one learning from my, from my side is when we hear all these inspirational stories, this is not longer an initiative of two or three people. This is a movement which I think reached an unstoppable momentum. And with that, I would like to close the session, hoping that you have many of your uh, Lily moments going forward in, in your family. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much.